this is Pat McDonald, your host for Vote for Vermont, where our tagline is listening beyond the sound bites. Joining me tonight is Ben Kinsley, who's the co-producer and co-host of the show, and a very special guest, someone I haven't chatted with too much over the years, and I'm very anxious to have this discussion. It's Dan Barlow, who is the public policy manager of VBSR, which is Vermont Business for Social Responsibility. Yes. Dan, welcome. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Thanks and for being here. It's my pleasure. There's another part of uh, Dan's background that I didn't know. Dan is the co-founder of Green Mountain Graveyards. So tonight's topic is about politics and graveyards. <laughs> so here we go. I'm so excited. We can skip through the, uh, the politics part and just go to the graveyard thing. Um, could you talk a little bit about yourself? Because we always ask our guests to chat about themselves. Sure. Um, I actually, I grew up in New Hampshire. Um, uh, my uh, father was a local police officer in, in Nashua, New Hampshire. Oh, nice. And uh, went to school in New Hampshire, but uh, got my first job in Brattleboro, Vermont, um, working as a journalist for the Brattleboro Reformer. And so, um, you know, it's fun. I like to say that I didn't understand what the word community meant t until I moved to Vermont. Oh, that's and, great. And, you know, and I really, you know, fell in love with the state so much. I love Vermont. I love uh, New Hampshire. Um, but I really, uh, you know, freedom and unity appealed to me more than live free or die. Um, so uh, that was in the early yeah. 2000s, and I haven't looked back since. And, um, you know, left journalism uh, about seven or eight years ago now and, and entered uh, uh, the business world. And uh, it's really, you know, Vermont is my home at this point, and I really love it. That's great. I love that comparison between live free or die and freedom and unity. <laughs> they're very Makes different. Yeah, yeah, they're very <laughs> exactly. different. Yeah, they're very different. Well, it's funny actually. I have a um, Nashua, New Hampshire connection. Oh. Also, my my uh, grandparents lived in Nashua for f almost fifty years, okay. and my dad grew up there oh. um, from uh, I think middle school on. Yeah. Um, so That's yeah. Cool. So and so I have lots of memories driving down to. Nashua and visiting in the summers and stuff like that. It's, it's a, a great area. And got, it is a great area. They've got yep. a lot of stores for people who want to shop. It's yeah. <laughs> There's lots of antique it's stores. Tax free New Hampshire, yes, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Lo lots of antique so, stores. For anyway, sure. you're, yeah. you are now the public policy manager for Vermont Business for Social Responsibility. And you are in charge of, so it says, uh, for the lobbying at the State House on health care reform, clean energy, and employment issues. Very. Uh, <sighs> broad range of stuff here. You must have been kept busy. And Dan is the recent, one of the recent winners of the oh, star. What the is the it? Rising, Rising Stars. Star. Yeah, There's Vermont Business Magazine. Every, yeah. Like, every year, right? That was a big Congrats. honor. Congrats. That's Thank you. great. Thank you. It yeah. really is an honor. It, it really was. And, uh, you know, they award that to people under 40, and I turn 40 next year, so I'm coming in just under <laughs> the <laughs> <laughs> just under the yeah. <laughs> missed it. That's yeah. great. So why don't you talk a little bit about VBSR? Those sure. Those are hard letters to yeah, I right. think That's if we, why I have yeah. to read it. <laughs> it's a little bit of a mouthful. So, yeah, uh, yeah Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. Uh, we are a statewide business organization. We've been around for almost 28, 28 years now. And, you know, really uh, the founders of the organization in the early 90s were business leaders in Vermont who, um, you know, felt like uh, the more traditional business organizations didn't necessarily speak for them, th uh, their business values, and um, recognizing that no one group has a monopoly on what's like good for business or what the business voice is. And they decided to form um, Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility and it started off as just a few dozen members back in the early 1990s and now we have more than 700 members across the state. Wow, that's great. And our businesses adhere to what we call the uh, the triple bottom line approach to business. So it's a uh, people, planet, and profits. And they often feel that when they take care of their workforce and they take care of their employees and they're good stewards of the environment, that helps their bottom line as that's a business. Great. And you know, people often ask me, you know, if a business is not a member of VBSR, does that mean they're not socially responsible or anything like that? And, and I reject that, that argument. I think every business, um, you know, sees what they do through a different lens. And some businesses identify as socially responsible and others may not, even if they're following some of the same practices. When you define business, I just thought of this, it's not even on my little question. What is, the, it could be um, a, an LLC or yep. anything up to a major corporation, right? I mean, that's, that's the world you're working. If you have 700 uh, members, they must c uh, cover a huge gamut of um, 
business types. It is, yeah. It, uh, we are a big tent organization, right. so um, and we have everything from people making you know value added food products in their kitchen all the way up to like right. Ben and Jerry's, which is owned by you know a multinational company. You know, right. uh, so a real broad range, and of course you know what's working for you know uh, what's important to a you know, small business is probably going to be a lot I different was than what's say, the, you know, the, um, the difference. So what they would like to see happen must be really different. At How times, do you yes. Keep them Keep them happy. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, we try to find common areas, you know, um, like uh, child care would be a great example. Mm -hmm. I think uh, almost every business in, in the state is impacted by our child care system. They have an employee who is, you know, struggling to find child care or struggling to afford child care. Um, so that's something, you know, where we have identified as a business issue that kind of crosses all those barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, health care would be another example, too. Mm -hmm. Great. And so you have this interesting um, balance between you know, uh, workers, communities, the environment, and of course, you know, being profitable as a business. Yep. Um, how do you balance those things as a business who's trying to be socially responsible and um, and and be a contributing member of society? Yeah, you know, I think sometimes um, you know we have uh, such a reputation that people assume things that we're for and s assume things that we're against. And you know, what I learned in my job is, um, you know kind of being a, an activist, you know, works for some organizations, um, but when you're working with business leaders, you need to talk in their language and in a way right. that they understand and appeals to them. So, like, you know, if you're talking about something like the minimum wage, um, you know, our position is going to be a lot different than the other organizations that are pushing for a higher minimum wage um, because we're working with a business community that says, you know, yes, we should, you know, keep on increasing worker salaries and put more money into the pockets of uh, working Vermonters, but you also have to recognize that if a business is paying health insurance, they're already probably paying about a seven dollar an hour minimum wage just for the just healthcare. for the benefits. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, seeing it through that lens, you know, I think that means we add a unique voice to the business debate. But sometimes right. it's like you're right and you're right, but you have to see this through the lens of what's uh, what the business community is experiencing. Right. And you got things like um, you know, uh, adding adding business costs like like a minimum wage, right? Yep. Where you're kind of tying the hands for businesses perhaps to have low margins um, and uh, you know typically that's like retail and food service and those types of industries yep um, but how do you in and then balancing that against what's ultimately good for you know, for both employers and employees because sometimes if you tie tie hands in such a way that you know yeah you know, it could lead into instability for mm -hmm. a business or for an employee where maybe they're like a great example of what happened under the Affordable Care Act is they, the Fed, federal government came out with 30 hours a week is the definition of a full-time employee. Yeah. So a lot of businesses just cut back their 40-hour week 20. people to 38 hours right. or 28 hours a week yeah. and so that they don't have to, they're not liable for health care benefits. So some of those things are kind of, you know, bigger picture are kind of diff more difficult to balance. Yeah, and often we try to find, you know, these big policy questions. Um, you know, how do we take that and uh, tinker with it internally and you know the nuances really matter like how can we take a big broad policy that has you know maybe broad public support or support the legislature and make it work for the business community so it still has that initial um, impact that the policymakers wanted but you can kind of clear that landing field for uh, for businesses and in fact like the Affordable Care Act and Vermont's health care reform efforts you know is a great example while you know we've done great work in uh, increasing access to health care for a lot of working Vermonters uh, the experience has been really kind of the opposite when it comes to the business community, and they've mm -hmm. seen increased prices, fewer options, right? Uh, and you really were at the, they're at the point now where they're like, we need relief. Yeah, you know? yeah, and that's it's an interesting um, because I think a lot of people would argue that uh, the Vermont's healthcare system was was actually better prior to the implementation of the Affordable Care Act, and that you know the ACA rules kind of really complicated the system that Vermont had previously, and, and in many ways worked better. You know, and I think at the time, you know, looking back, um, it was kind of an imperfect marriage where we're tr they were trying to connect what the ACA was doing and then the reforms that the Shumlin administration wanted to do at times maybe necessarily didn't hold hands the way right. they really wanted it to. Well, I mean, you look at Vermont Health Connect, $250 million, probably closer to $350 million now because of the ongoing maintenance yep. um, spending on it. And that's before we even provide health care. That's just right, yeah. that's just an infrastructure right. piece. That's not even providing care. Like, what could we have done with that money if we had actually put it towards, 
you know, increasing outcomes or, or getting people pr into preventative treatment programs or whatever. Yeah, and, and the, you know, the, the ironic part is that um, um, it ended up being the, the private insurance companies who, you know, stepped in when Vermont Health Connect failed and maintained health insurance right. for right. a lot That's of right. Vermonters. Yeah. And, you know, Blue Cross Blue Shield is a, a longtime VBSR member. And, you know, I think sometimes, like, you know, uh, Insurance companies get a bad reputation, um, but here in Vermont, you know, for the most part, they operate, you know, um, as fairly good corporate citizens. I would love yeah. to have Don George on this show. How, he, how Blue Cross Blue Shield, this is serious, has managed to be so flexible. Yeah. I, I don't even know how they're still standing um, and, and hopefully being profitable because we've we've changed our mind more than once and they've had to shift 360. Yeah. And I really give him a lot of credit well, and his staff. Part of that is cuz they have such a large market cap that you know they can kind of afford they to do that. They can play around a yeah. little bit. They are now. the big the big fish in the yeah, pond right, right now. Yeah. So, yeah. It's yes, like we do. 75% of the individual market. Mhm. Mm but we do play a few uh, uh, twists and turns on them and they've managed to stay up with us so and help in this particular case yes so good for them so I checked out I always check out everybody's website some good some not so good yours is very good by the way thank you and you've you've listed four mission sort of statements and I was hoping when it's economic development education public influence and networking and I was hoping if you want to take each one of those and talk about what do you do um, in each of these areas sure um, and so first obviously economic development um, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, the lobbying part, the policy program within VBSR is just one part of what we do as a business organization. So there's a whole staff up in Burlington uh, that I work with and our executive director works with. Um, so on economic development, you know, right now, uh, two of the things we're doing is we run the Vermont intern program. Um, so we get some uh, funding from uh, the Vermont DOL uh, to, um, you know, pay for a part-time staffer within VBSR oh, that works great. to connect um, businesses that are looking f to attract that emerging workforce and recent college graduates who are looking for their first, you know, uh, step into the workplace. Excellent. And these are paid internships too. So, uh, and we really believe strongly that internships should be should oh, I'm be. I'm with you on that one. It, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I feel Slave so labor. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's terrible. I yeah. agree with you. Um, so we've been running that for a few years, and that's a that's a big success. And you know, um, I know I hire my interns through this program as well, and many of my interns that work for me at the State House end up going on to work for VBSR businesses after the internship has ended. Right. Um, so that's a pretty key component. Uh, we also run the uh, Local First Coupon book. It's uh, uh, Ver uh, Local First Vermont. And uh, every year we put out a big, thick um, book of coupons. Oh, for, I've seen that. I bought a couple over there. Yeah, you can They're get it like, great. Yeah. yeah. And these are all purely Vermont-owned businesses. So you won't see like, you know, Ben & Jerry's or Green Mountain Coffee as much as we love these companies. We really wanted to do purely locally I owned know that businesses. Was you. Congratulations. That was us, that's yeah. A, that's it's, a great gift, so by the way. <laughs> Christmas is coming. Yes, yes. It's yes. a great <laughs> gift. You know, it's funny because, so I was in Speeder and Earl's this morning mm -hmm. um, on Pine Street in Burlington. And they had the VBSR coupon book right on the front counter. And I'm like, how ironic is that? Because, you know, and, uh, but I didn't realize you guys even did that yeah. until, yeah, until I fun. saw the book. And uh, it's, it's, so it's kind of like a local vor type exactly. thing. Where you, yeah, yep. it's very cool. And, you know, it really started kind of focused on Chittenden and Washington County. And we've since added Middlebury and Brattleboro right. and Bennington and Manchester, other parts of the state. They want to be part of the book. Right. And, you know, people want to not only like support their locally owned businesses and save a little bit money, but it also is useful to find out what other businesses in your community are locally owned and right. maybe, you know, they can direct some more of their shopping that that's, way. That's great. It's, Thank you for that. It's thick, too. It's like an inch no, thick. It's a big book. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's thicker than the stuff phone books, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Whoever does that must be busy all year long. That's, yes, yes. That's quite a project. <laughs> Okay, so the education piece. Education piece. So often, uh, you know, when I'm not at the state house uh, and, and they go home for the year, my job shifts from lobbying uh, for our members to working with our members to help them uh, understand complex policy issues. So, for example, you know, over the summer and fall this year, we held five workshops for our members on uh, minimum wage, clean water, independent contractors, and a few other issues ah. where we, we, you know, we'll bring in some uh, experts to kind of talk about what are the, the big policy issues around this, and then we, you know, have a conversation with our members about, you know, what they're experiencing in their business and how that relates to the policy question. Um, so, and then on the back 
back end once a law passes in Vermont, we often work with our members to help them understand the law. So what does the, you know, the paid sick day law say? What are your requirements as a business if you aren't oh, already great. offering that? Um, because we want to make sure they're compliant with law. So you mentioned one of the, our favorite words here, yeah. independent contractors. Yes. And um, I'd like to you explain where you are on that issue, because we can certainly tell you where we are. <laughs> 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 if you watch the show, we, we're not very good at hiding. Well, it's one of those that's, you know, our first show together was independent <coughs> contractors. That's right. That's and, right. Uh, and our last show that we just did, we talked a little bit about independent contractors. We're supposed contractors. to be neutral, but I'm not sure we've carried that off successfully <laughs> in this particular, uh, but maybe you could... Sure. Explain it. And how it ended at the session. Sure. So uh, our approach to uh, this issue is that, um, you know, the traditional employment system uh, in Vermont, which, you know, you're an employee, you get all the benefits that comes with being an employee and all the protections, that's been responsible for helping to build the middle class in Vermont in a lot of ways. Um, but our economy is changing. It's changing very rapidly, and state laws don't often keep up with the changes in our economy. And so we think that there is room in, our, in the Vermont economy for both a strong employment system that protects people who want to be employees and for entrepreneurs and sole proprietors who want to be independent contractors, who want to follow that dream of working for themselves. And uh, the ABC test that we have right now in Vermont it's right. not working. Right. No. Um, it's too yeah. old. It just doesn't work. It's, it's totally out of date. Right. Um, and uh, it, almost every scenario you put through there, it comes out employee. And uh, it, there's no flexibility to allow for these sole proprietors, these true independent contractors, right. you know, have their shingle out and they have a business card uh, who want to work for Vermont companies. They're being frozen out. And a lot of Vermont companies are contracting out of state right, right. now because the, they're, they're, they're afraid to hire them. Absolutely. Because they yeah. don't want the Department of Labor coming after them and they don't want you know yeah yeah uh, so we need a, a better test yeah. uh, we need a change in compliance when it comes to the Department of Labor um, and you know earlier this year VBSR suggested that Vermont adopt the the federal test which is a six-part uh, totality of the circumstances Ooh. test mm -hmm. so it kind of takes the ABC test breaks it out into little a few more parts and you don't have to hit yes with every question you look at the whole scenario and to us that allowed that still had the essential protections for employees and allowed for the flexibility where more independent contractors could work for Vermont yeah. companies. So you have to hit like maybe four out of six criteria is that kind of like the something idea? like four out of six five out of six yeah yeah, yeah. And, and this state constantly tries to attract entrepreneurs mm -hmm. right and it just that just doesn't make sense to have the ABC test and and, and encourage people to be entrepreneurs and, mm -hmm. and build their own small businesses. So one of the one of the great examples of the the current failure of the ABC test that I've heard is um, a woman who worked for Dealer.com mm -hmm. in their marketing department. Yep. And had a, a child, um, and she wanted to work from home, so she had flexibility, both what hours she worked. She, uh, she worked from a home office. Um, and you know the, the dealer.com's um, employment policy is such that she wouldn't have that flexibility as an employee. Mm, yeah. And uh, so she wanted to become an independent contractor, still yeah. doing basically the work that she was doing before. Right. Uh, but because the one of the criteria of the ABC test is that an, a current employee cannot be doing the same type of work, like right. the nature work, of the business. Yeah. The nature of the business. Yep. And because she was doing the same type of work as she was doing as an employee that failed the ABC test. Yeah. And so basically, yeah. um, you know, they, she basically had to leave her job and she couldn't and she couldn't work at all because yeah. she didn't meet the definition for an independent contractor. Yeah, because it's who, who's yeah. uh, telling you what to do, who's looking at your work. Right. And in her case, it would have been dealer.com. Right, so. yeah. And, yeah. And, you know, it's unfortunate, like, you know, and I think that's one of the examples of a changing workforce. It's not just like, it used to be construction workers. This was the big deal for yeah. them. Where you have, yep. you know, a general contractor and subcontractors, and they're all working on different pieces of a project. But we're starting to see that in technology businesses mm -hmm. now, where programmers are working in that type of environment. And suddenly it's, you know, this 21st century workforce is running into issues around that type of thing. So I'm, yeah. I'm kind of curious. There's a so there's a Supreme Court case in Vermont this summer that at least for um, the unemployment insurance side of it clarified that if you are if you have an independent LLC, yeah. that's that's a blanket test. Yeah. That doesn't matter if you meet any of the ABC criteria. If you have an independent LLC, that you meet those. What is your take on that? And and oh, there's another piece to that we'll probably talk about in a minute here. But what's what was your take on the Supreme Court? 
um, decision. A lot of my members uh, really welcomed that decision. They thought it provided a lot of clarity uh, right now where there isn't a lot of clarity. Right. So, um, you know, we saw that as uh, a successful step forward. Uh, I think the, the, on the other side of the coin there is um, you have to make sure that um, there aren't situations where a business is, is, you know, hiring someone that should be an employee and then, oh, by the way, here's the forms to become an LLC. Um, so that they're, you know, kind of strong arming someone who really should be an employee into forming an LLC right at the hiring site. So right. we want to make sure that doesn't happen. And there's probably an easy fix to that. Um, but it did provide a lot of clarity um, with the Supreme Court decision. And we right. hopefully that will, you know, I know the legislature has been kind of stuck on this issue for a long time. Years. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know. <laughs> when I was commissioner of labor, this is what we were dealing with. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like well, a grief. Well, I, and I know like from the businesses I've heard, you know, I've talked to is like it, it probably is not a perfect solution, but it, it's much more clear than it was before because, you know, as an employer, you can be sitting down and trying to figure out, is this person a contractor or an employee? And it can be really difficult. You, it, you have to go hire a lawyer to tell you, really. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or risk, you know, the Department of Labor coming up with a different uh, a different, you know, analysis than you did. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, there is probably no perfect solution here, and we felt the proposal we put on the table was probably as close as we can get. Yeah. Well, and we like had it. business supporting it. We had some labor groups saying we can be comfortable with this, you know. So we felt like we kind of found that sweet spot. I hope the legislature revisits it, revisits it in uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. an easy economic development issue, you Absolutely. know. And I'd love to see, you know, the governor standing up with the legislature, signing this bill into law, and everyone right. celebrating. A Allowing uh, well, independent, you independent contractors to yeah. succeed. So, well, and the other piece of this issue is the workers' compensation um, piece yes. of it because um, there forever has been two different definitions of employee between unemployment insurance and workers' comp. Yeah, and that's still the case even with the Supreme Court decision because yes. it, it only clarified for unemployment insurance. Do you think there should be one common definition, and 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 the, should the state move towards that? Uh, I do. I think uh, business leaders are asking for uh, one test for both uh, UI and workers' compensation. That yeah. would be easier on the business owner uh, instead of having multiple tests for you know different benefit streams. Yeah. Uh, it just makes sense. Can we find one test that works for both of them? Um, that may be a harder nut to crack right. because you are getting into uh, insurance regulations and the insurance industry as well. I just so. hope they fix it because every business person we have on this sh uh, show, and I'm sure all your members, they just want predictability, yes. clarity. I mean, just just tell us what's mm. the tax, what's the rules, yes. and quit changing them and make them easy and let me do my let me do my work. Right. They want to make clear. widgets. They don't want to <laughs> be you know exactly. concerned about. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. 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 That's what we. Especially do. for you know smaller businesses like you know if you mom and pop shops that probably don't have an HR person to yeah. help. Right, navigate exactly. this type of thing absolutely yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so we want to make something you where you know everyone can just look at it and, and make that quick judgment call right. about whether the scenario fits or not so that's cool so just back on to really quickly because we're I'm looking at the clock and I want to get to those gravy mm -hmm. ones. So, <laughs> <laughs> forget the real reason we brought you here um, <coughs> public influence that's pretty obvious you're out uh, doing what you're doing yep. now, right yep educating us Mm -hmm. um, and networking, that's the same sort of thing, um, but maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Sure. So we have mm -hmm. uh, a networking event for our members and really kind of anyone who wants to come about once a month or so. Mm -hmm. So uh, just last month we were down in Springfield at Black River Produce. Oh, um, you. you know, great company down there. So we had, I think it was about, I wasn't actually at that event. I had a conflict that night, but I think we had about 60 folks turn out, you know, right. got a tour of their facilities. Mark Curran talked about some of the, like the energy efficiency work they've done. Done, uh, to reduce their energy energy costs and you know the way he works to support our local farms and our local food That's system great. so you know we often find that you know business leaders love kind of getting a, a look behind the scenes at other businesses and how they're doing their operations and our businesses and in fact I think the business community as a whole in Vermont they're very happy to even sit down with a competitor and say hey this is working for me maybe it's gonna work for you too that's great uh, the chamber here in Washington County does a, something similar to that yeah I'm always tagging along because I love it yeah it's, just, it's a great way to network and you learn about somebody else's business and yeah. they don't mind a few out of boys too so yes that's a good thing. right well right. you have some industries here where it really is like you're all in this together um, yes. like like the beer industry is yes. a great example um, or the cheese industry you know mm -hmm. where you have so many of these small um, you know small uh, uh, 
you know, companies that are doing this type of thing that are part of this market. Maple is another example, right? right? Where you have you know a really common interest within Vermont to try to you know for everyone to do well because if you know if everyone's doing well, it's going to help the industry. Right. They don't look at each other suspiciously. I think maybe right. some other businesses do in other states. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Um, so this is probably a tough question, okay. but if you had to pick, what are the top five most socially responsible businesses in the state? Oh uh, boy, uh, and we won't tell <laughs> any, yeah, we won't tell them that yeah, you said exactly. that. You know. I know, uh, you know, so I, I won't go for the top, but these are kind of like maybe the folks that like float uh, to, or right now are really active in doing some innovative stuff. Yeah. Uh, I would think of um, The Alchemist over in oh, Stowe. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Jen Kimmick. Yeah, I mean, um, amazing company, you know, great story. And, you know, I know with their new facility, um, they were very concerned about clean water. And they went right. above and beyond what state and federal regulations required because they wanted to ensure that their discharge, you know, was, uh, was, not, a, was not polluted. That, you them. know, that they, they really kind of, that's part of their DNA as a company. They're like, hey, you know, we make beer, we need clean water, and they want to be a good steward. So, you know, Very it's companies cool. like that who are doing some really innovative things. Uh, and I mentioned Mark Curran earlier with Black River Produce. Right. I mean, the way that, you know, he has, you know, literally connected farms to people's dining room tables and what's on their plate. Uh, is amazing, and he's kind of revolutionized, you I'm know, so that industry. Down. Farm to plate. Oh, I it, can't tell you how how excited I get being at a restaurant that's farm to plate, where you read where the eggs came from. And I love meat. it. I love it. Yeah, me too. Me great. too. Uh, and I mean, that's you looking back in a few years, for the past few years, that's really one of Vermont's economic yeah. success yeah. stories was Absolutely. recognizing yeah. the opportunity with our food system yeah. uh, to you know keep some of that money locally and support the growth of new businesses. We so. just had. Uh, Anson Tebbets on a few weeks ago yep. and he talked all about like how much success there's been in the farm to plate initiative in the uh, you know specialty foods mm -hmm. industry and it's really amazing I mean you think you know um, farm to plate and Vermont has got a great brand reputation mm -hmm. in farm to plate and we have so many opportunities for absolutely that. So absolutely as you're speaking I'm thinking of putting a panel together of these folks that you're mentioning so you mentioned two yeah wouldn't that be a great discussion that would be, a, be really fun yeah. so you've got yeah. the alchemist black river produce anybody else that comes to mind you know I think of something like a company like seventh generation oh, up, yes. up in Burlington yeah. of course you know they have an environmental ethic and uh, they're really interested in um, you know, their energy use and their yeah. employees energy use too so um, they decided to company a few years ago that they were going to put a, a price on carbon pollution internally as a company and then use that money to help their employees you know do energy efficiency work at their houses and that was a really innovative model to help their workforce make sure that their homes are buttoned up and that they're not you know wasting money uh, it's going out through the roof right. and so as a company they're like we want to be more energy efficient and we want to support our workforce and, and they found a really w a way to connect those two things Excellent. very cool very nice. So, um, as you noted in your intro, you do most of the lobbying for VBSR. Yep. Uh, you have some interns uh, yep. also that help you with that. Um, but in, and you also have a public policy um, blog, uh, and you talked a little bit about uh, the 2017 legislative agenda. Yep. Um, and some of the issues, I'm just going to run through a couple of the issues that um, were on there. But effective use of state contracting, uh, clean water economy, child care affordability, Supporting independent contractors, I think we've beaten that one to death. <laughs> um, and, a, and a zero carbon economy, which yes. you just mentioned yep. a little bit yep. um, in seventh generation. Maybe some we could of the do stuff clean there. water because um, that's, yeah. that's just won't stop. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm yeah. very upset where we are. Talk about another one that we've been dealing with for decades. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my know. God. I mean, it seems like every governor who comes in kind of makes this bold proclamation yeah, then, that they're going to be the governor who tackles right. this problem. Yeah. And it, it's almost similar to broadband in the same way where, yeah. you know, right, exactly. we've been trying that to get... That last mile. <laughs> yeah, that last mile. Yeah. And I tell you, you know, um, there are so many businesses in Vermont that not only rely on clean water for their internal operations, but are part of the tourism economy. Uh, absolutely. Lake you know, Champlain is, a, is a, uh, an economic engine. Absolutely. And I don't understand why we don't get it, how important that is to Vermont. It right. Is, it's huge. It's I mean, just... those days in uh, September of this year, we had, you know, record-breaking temperatures, and it was like, you know, August, and the beaches in Burlington were closed. Yeah. And because of why? Because of the... Uh, because of the phosphorus algae. outbreak. Oh. 
And yeah, it was, it was like the three main beaches, and then you have Lake Carmi. You know, I know I love camping, and I camp in Vermont State Parks all the time. And I went to Lake Carmi a few years ago, and I couldn't swim there, oh, and nice. I had no idea. And I was like, I'm never going back to to Lake Carmi. Right. And I know that's the experience of other people from out of state when they come here expecting us, the, the green state in exactly. Vermont, to have clean it's water. Part of that, that brand <laughs> yeah. you they talk expect about. a green state, not a green yeah, lake. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Blue. yeah. yeah. Um, so. You know, uh, I think there's still a lot of education to be done with Vermonters, but connecting the problem and the solution. And, and you know, most people don't see it unless their local beach is closed or yeah. they get like a boil water notice for their municipal water. Um, so we want to make these connections a little better and we have to identify, you know, a stable uh, financing mechanism to support these clean water projects okay. and, you know, clean up whether it's, you know, a farm or, you know, a parking so lot, you know. What's going to get this to work? Because I know right yeah. now we've got the treasurer fighting a little bit with the funding and mm -hmm. where, what's going on. Man, um, if I had a crystal ball for no. that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. So this could go on for a while. Unfortunately, you know, and I think I think we've made we strides made, yeah, okay. in the so past few years. We're going in the right direction we just are. fast enough. Yeah, that's the question is, is, are we moving fast enough? And then logistically, what projects are kind of shovel ready that we can start funding right away that will have an impact on clean water? Right. Because right. they gave us... I want to watch the time period. They yep. gave us money, and then they weren't quite ready. They didn't have a plan in place. Yeah. But then the governor said, "Well, we'll put a plan. We'll make up a plan in a couple of months, and we still have the year to spend the money." Is that where we are right now, or has it gotten? Because I'm not sure why Beth, Beth Pierce got um, upset about the money or something. I don't. Um, I don't know quite how it's all working. Sure, and I think it depends on who you talk to right now. Some folks think we have enough money in the system or enough money to lined up to do to do the work and others, you know, uh, think we need to, to kind of, you know, find a new stable funding mechanism so we can keep that money oh, coming into there. Um, and it's also a question of like what is the state infrastructure to actually administer the, this money mm, and to pick yeah. which projects okay. have the best, right. the most benefit for yeah. Vermont. And those are pretty complex issues, yeah. you know. Um, so, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if the legislature next year tackles the idea of some kind of, you know, in, infrastructure within state government to decide which projects get funded. Another study you know. group. Uh, not a study group. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <God>. oh. <laughs> Sorry, I love study groups, but been on when you work in state government, your whole summer is, is <laughs> involved with study groups. Yeah. And as a lobbyist, and I spend my summer at those it's meetings too. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Middle of July when yeah. you really don't want to be in the state house. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Those recommendations, yeah. <clears throat> but some kind of a, a group to look at it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right ahead there, Ben. Well, so we've got, um, there's other some other legislative initiatives that you've got uh, coming up, and we'll talk a little bit later, I think, about what your um, 2018 legislative plan is. I know you haven't released it yet, yep. but you can probably give us a little bit of an idea of what you're working on. Yep. But some of the things you, you have been working on are um, paid sick leave, mm -hmm. uh, ban the box, health care reform. Yep. Um, uh, the green procurement order, which was from the Shumlin administration. Uh, Vermont Chemical Reform Bill, uh, which I think is PFOA as well as a couple other things, yep. right? Yep. Um, and the Public Retirement Study Committee. Yeah, I think uh, actually the Public Retirement um, uh, uh, um, proposal was probably one of the big successes yeah. uh, this year. And I have to, you know, the Treasurer's that Office. Was a great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a bipartisan effort, you know. Yeah. 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 And you know, I know so many businesses, you know, who. They want to take care of their employees, but they can't afford, right. you know, a, a 401k match for their workers. And this is setting up an infrastructure, uh, and it's, you know, not going to cost the state a ton of money, um, and it's going to help these businesses and their workers. A lot of nonprofits workers, so. lose people because, and one that I was associated with couldn't afford to to provide a pension. Right. And now, I know this takes effect 2000. I think Not now. It's a couple of years out. I think maybe. it might be next year or next maybe year? a little bit. I know they're putting together a board now okay. to oversee the program. Because to have yeah. those nonprofits offer a pension to their employees will really help probably with Mary Moulton and, and mm. the mental health because they're losing. Oh, oh it's very, it's, right, it's right. almost a crisis right now in the mental health area. Yeah. So maybe this is, I don't know, who did Beth think of this? I mean, this came out of uh, Beth's work and Beth yeah. put together a committee of business leaders a Good few years her. ago to look at this. Yeah. Um, and 
this is Great you know idea. one of the big successes of, of, of this year. It was a tough legislative year in a lot of ways up there, and this was one of the really the shining moments. That's I thought. Right. Yeah, I think this is um, you know because we talked to uh, um, Treasurer Pierce about it. Um, and it's a, it was a great, yeah. a great idea. I mean, how it's it's such a, a no brainer. Like you said, it's you know very little money. Yep. Yep. Um, and, and it helps a lot. And it helps people. a lot, right. particularly with small businesses who yeah. can't, like you said, put together something like this on their own. Yeah. And again, I mean, this isn't a mandatory program. Nope. You know, uh, businesses, if they want to participate, they can. Right. Uh, and uh, the employees will be able to pay in. So yeah, uh, it was one. a win win for everyone. That's a great one. Yeah. 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 So, kind of on that same note, like, um, what kind of healthcare reform initiatives are you looking at? Um, you mentioned earlier that the the uh, insurance premiums really are yeah. are becoming a really prohibitive factor for many businesses. Mm -hmm. um, so, what kind of reform initiatives are you looking at at this point, and and how are they faring in the legislature? Sure. Um, let me give you a quick example of how bad the problem is right now. So, the example I like to turn to is uh, Small Dog Electronics. Everyone oh. knows this company. Yeah, you right. hear their ads on VPR. Yeah. Don Mayer, the owner, when he started in business, you know, 20, 25 years ago, he could insure an employee and their family for $1,500. And today, oh. for just that employee, not their family, it's $15,000. Right. Yeah. It's, it's crippling. It, it absolutely is. And, you know, he's someone who wants to pay his workers, you know, a good wage. He wants to take care of them. But health care is killing him. And he is just one example out of hundreds across Vermont of businesses who, you know, recognize that uh, for the most part, people get their health insurance through their job. That's still the system we have, although it's not mandatory. And, you know, they have to sometimes compete against companies that aren't doing that. And, right. you know, that's their right as a business, but it really kind of makes an unlevel playing field, you and know? I think yeah. people realize in Vermont what the small margin of profit is. <sighs> Most of it, not the giant whatever, right. like the Walmarts, but the mom and pops that you're talking about, their their margin of profit is pathetic. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know they don't have the money people think they do. Right, that people think they have this magic sack yeah, exactly. where they can just pull well, you're money a business, out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I have business owners who are paying themselves less yeah. than their average employee is making. Right. You know, mm -hmm. uh, just to keep the business yeah. afloat. So uh, with healthcare. Uh, and as I said earlier, you know, the reforms over the past few years didn't have the impact that the business community really wanted to see. Um, so we are looking at what innovative new models there might be. You know, our long-term plan is we want to have a system where everyone has health insurance, you know, and we need to cut that tie between a job and insurance. You know, you shouldn't lose your insurance if you lose your job. You should be able to move right. from job to right. job. Right. And you, why would something that's so important to your life change, you know? Um, so let's make that a portable benefit. You know, one option we're looking at is can we, you know, invest in primary care here in Vermont, you know, the family doctors, the right. family physicians, and, you know, every successful healthcare uh, system across the world started with investing in primary care and getting you know people access to their doctors so we can catch medical problems early when it's cheaper and we keep people away from the emergency room um, but quite frankly you know there's no silver bullet here with this problem you know I think as our current president you know said recently uh, he never realized healthcare was so complex you know yeah and there are so many policy issues I didn't realize how complex they were until I started hanging out at the state house right. and realizing right. the world's not black and white you right. know right. Um, yeah. so uh, you know we're looking at ways we think you know investing in primary care is one option uh, and right now I have a group of members who are, um, you know, been meeting monthly and, you know, talking to folks like, you know, Ham Davis and others, you know, experts in the field of healthcare, yep, right. and saying what innovative things can Vermont do that's going to meet our goals of expanding coverage but also reducing costs. I saw a headline I'm going to say because I didn't read the article, but that doctors are starting to think about charging fees, yep. which is the, um, what do they call that, um, uh, when, when you're really hiring them right. to be there for you. So there, a lot of doctors are starting, there's a word for it, uh, starting to ask for fees. That's going to upset the apple cart a little. Yeah, I think I saw that. There's, I think, two doctors down yeah. in Townsend, Vermont, right. I think, right. who were going to start, like, it's like yeah. a monthly subscription yeah. almost. Right. right. And you'll yeah. have access to the doctor as much as you, you do or don't need, right. you know? Right. Um, My dentist just started doing this. Oh, okay, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's an, so it's an interesting, I think you're right, I think they're, they're innovations. Concierge doctor, I knew it was yeah. in my brain yeah. somewhere, that's it. I think yeah. you're right though, I think there are innovations uh, coming down the pipe and it's and it's interesting because um, uh, uh, I was at the Green Mountain Care Board meeting today and the head of the Vermont One Care, which mm -hmm. is the statewide ACO, um, 
said in the in the meeting said the ACO is not about saving money. Mm -hmm. It's about providing maintaining the level of quality of care. Yeah. And of course the ACO idea and the all payer waiver was sold as a cost saving mechanism. Right, right, right. And so here you have the head of that effort saying it's not going to save any money it's going to mm -hmm. it's going to maintain the level of care that we have yeah and it's been interesting you know all the reformers whether it's state or federal have done a really good job at expanding coverage that that's the easy part you know mm -hmm. but reigning in costs is the tougher part and you know whether it was you know like romney care in massachusetts you know back in the uh, mid 2000s or it's the affordable care act um, neither of those really got that right, right you know, right. in any way. So we all want it when we want it, right? Yeah, yeah, we do, and we do, and and not so expensive either. So yeah, before yeah. we switch to my other topic yep. here, is we have about a minute or two. Is there anything else you want to talk about about um, your organization and what it's up to? Um, you know, uh, you know, looking into uh, the 2018 session, and you know, we'll be announcing our legislative agenda. Um, early in December yeah. and um, you know I expect we'll be working on we'll be talking a lot about health care uh, we'll be talking about independent contractors to see if we can break um, you know the how stuck that issue has been up there um, and we'll be talking a lot about clean water and you know the one issue that uh, has really kind of raised up uh, in the past year is um, the opioid addiction oh mm -hmm. right I've heard right. you know I had a moment where yeah. I was in a meeting with business leaders and it came up and everyone in the room just kind of nodded like yep, they all right. had a personal right. story whether it's a family member or an employee and suddenly this is a business issue and uh, I'm not quite sure you know what VBSR's role will be in that discussion we want to recognize that there's a lot of other folks at the table already right. um, but we're gonna look at ways to see how the well, business we had community Joe Linda can... LeClaire in oh, here, yes and that was quite informative mm -hmm. I mean, she has got a plate full to the brim uh, yep. I don't know how they're gonna tackle it tell you the truth but they've got to yeah, have got to find, and I think she will probably talk to you and your members because you're right. We are all going to be impacted. Absolutely. Well, that's what the governor uh, says, right? If you um, if you don't think you're affected by this, you haven't been paying attention. Right. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Well, Absolutely. E equipment. Uh, I mean, this <coughs> goes on forever. Mm -hmm. And his uh, six three one with that one child born every day with uh, opiate addiction. Yeah. Good grief. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's it's really shocking. Well, and and one of the key things that Joe Linda had um, identified and the opioid coordination council had identified as um, getting people who are uh, who have a substance abuse issue back into their communities and re-engage in their communities is having a job. Yes. Yes. Right. And yes. so engaging jobs. engaging the business community is one of the things that they're going to be looking yeah. at very closely. And we've how. committed to doing a lot of shows with yeah. Joe Linda Great. to keep people advised because I think nobody, anybody who's watching is going to want to know about this because it's just everywhere. Absolutely. It's, it's got to be costing us big bucks somewhere. So yes, um, yes. That's, I mean, besides the tragedy of the individuals and the stuff, but it's costing us huge money. Absolutely. Okay. That's it. Okay, we're gonna do the fun stuff this. now. Yeah, we're okay. Do this. I am passionate about well, this. Wasn't radio. <laughs> <laughs> so when I spoke today, I had no idea his other life was the co-founder of Green Mountain Graveyards, and I was just telling him um, before uh, we started the show, I, I actually tour around graveyards. We mm -hmm. just we get besides my love for Gettysburg and all the yep. uh, all the his Civil War and everything, I also go around Vermont and and especially Hope Cemetery, which is. The, the creme de la creme. Yes. So tell us about this organization and how you got started and what you do. I'm so excited. So, um, you know, I grew up in New England, and obviously New England has uh, a, a history of really, you know, some outstanding cemetery artwork and some very old stones. Um, and, uh, you know, I grew up in New Hampshire, and uh, I would always go to the local cemetery and just kind of, you know, be in awe of the stonework and, you know, what was called the uh, the memento more period, you know, of, of the artwork where, uh, you know, there's the skull and crossbones, you know, with the wings and, oh, right. uh, you know, a lot of conversations about, um, you know, what happens to us when we die, you know, why are we alive? And, you know, very quickly just fell kind of almost down the rabbit hole, you know, in a lot of ways 
ways of both the, the history and the art around um, cemeteries. And um, I kind of, and, and so that went away in my life a little bit. And I kind of joke I had an early midlife crisis <laughs> and decided to start hanging out in cemeteries again. Uh, and over the past five or six years, I've been to hundreds of Vermont cemeteries, um, been photographing them and researching them. I'm working on uh, my first book right now, which is kind of like a field guide to right. Vermont cemeteries and look at both, you know, important historical figures that are buried in Vermont and how their life connects to the artwork on their stones, um, but also, you know, uh, artwork that's unique to Vermont. And Hope Cemetery is a great example, yeah, you know. Yeah. I mean, people from across the world come there um, to see the work that was produced in Barry, Vermont, right. you know, a hundred years ago. It's great. Well, I tell you, everybody who visits from out of state, I say, I'm going to take you to the Hope Cemetery. They look at me like, I'm, like I'm, something's wrong with me. I said, oh, just wait, just wait. Yep, yep. And uh, it's great. So who, what is the most surprising person that's buried in Vermont that no one would know about? You know, uh, one of my favorites is uh, down in Brattleboro, uh, Colonel James Fisk. And he died, uh, I think it was the, the late 1800s. And he was, uh, he was a bit of a robber baron back, back in the day. Oh, boy. He, he grew up in Bennington, made his fortune in uh, New York City, was all over the tabloids for always dating starlets, and he also had a pretty bad reputation when it came to business. He some sleazy tactics. Uh, he would rip off partners, you know, um, and at one point was um, one of the, the, the business leaders behind a uh, gold scheme that led to the first Black Friday um, gold uh, crash in the 1800s. Uh, so he had a larger than life, you know, persona, uh, had, you know, many wives, many mistresses, you know. Um, right, Colonel. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, when he died, he wanted to be buried down at Prospect Hill Cemetery in Brattleboro. And uh, his stone, which is kind of set way back in, in the back of the cemetery, you can't see it from the street. It's, I'm still shocked that this stone is here in Vermont. It's uh, a, a tall obelisk, and then surrounding the obelisk are four statues of topless women. And each one <laughs> is holding some symbol of his empire when he was alive. You should ask Governor Douglas about the statues of topless women. Oh, Remember yeah, that? right. Remember the, oh, the lamp. Yes, the lamp. Right. 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 Yes. When you said that, that's sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, for, so for viewers <laughs> that are unaware, um, there is a, uh, a lamp with a... It's an Indian. It's an Indian, it's an Indian statue, statue right. uh, but it's a, turned into a lamp. That sits on the governor's uh, ceremonial desk right. in the state house, and Governor Douglas asked for it to be removed. Yep. Yes, right. Because well, he didn't want the kids would come into his office, and it'd be all it's sort of eye level. Eye level, and yes. Cause a little stir, so yes. he asked for it yeah. to go away. Yeah. So. And so that's it's just an unusual stone. It's almost something you'd see in like Europe, you know, not in kind of you know Puritan Vermont, you know. Um, so that's one of my. And he's such a larger than life figure, Wait, and and you can out. really connect his life and his attitude about life to his grave. You know, that's I mean, great. it just, it screams his personality. So that's one of my favorite stories. So you also, I, I read where you focus on changing symbols and motifs mm -hmm. and what they mean with, and you mentioned that before about death and, yeah. and how it all relates. Is there a way you could summarize that for us about what that all means? Sure. Um, so the, um, the artwork on gravestones, you can track how the artwork changed over a number of decades to the changing spiritual beliefs of the local communities. So the best example is um, what's called the uh, traditional death's head. And actually, you don't see these in Vermont because uh, our cemeteries are a little newer. Uh, these are from like the 1600s, and that's the skull with the wings. And those are all over like, you know, Salem, Mass, and Cambridge, Mass, Portsmouth, Portland. Um, and, um, you know, that was from an era where it was, you know, Puritan New England and, um, you know, no one was kind of quite sure if when they die, if you do go to heaven or not. And the focus was, you know, uh, that death is a, a permanent end and the artwork really f reflected the idea of the body being in the ground. And you can see how this is not maybe palatable to families that are mourning, you know. Right. Um, and so over a period of about uh, 50 to 100 years, that death's head literally transformed into the cherub head that we see on oh. newer stones. And um, so that transformation happened about over about 50 years. 
and the whole artwork softened a lot. You saw the weeping willows come in. Um, a popular image is you'll see a, a hand with the finger pointing up to heaven. And uh, as the artwork softened, you know, uh, it also you could track that to the changing spiritual beliefs of Vermonters, where they were, you know, less focused on the kind of the gory details and uh, not knowing what was happening to a more comforting, comfort, comforting idea of the afterlife that you knew you were united in heaven with your family, with people you miss. And uh, the artwork started reflecting that sentimentality more uh, than the, the grim and gory history that it had before. Um, you know, I, I mentioned you don't see the skull and crossbones in Vermont, but you'll see some, uh, you'll see memento mori, which is, you know, Latin for remember you will die. Uh, you see that still on some stone, mm. some older stones here in Vermont. And some of the older artwork I've seen is you'll see sometimes uh, a small coffin carved on some of mm -hmm. the older, older work, which is, mm. a, and again, a, a, a remnant of that older memento mori um, period. So, kind um, like part and, of that transition, you know, where they're transitioning to a softer, Exactly. You know, symbolism. Yeah, so it went from, you know, the coffin to, you know, moving over to the urn, you know, with, with ashes. And often you'll see, like, the urn with a weeping willow tree uh, hmm. over, over it. So, and of course, now we're in the era where technology uh, allows anyone to put almost anything they want on sure. their gravestone. That's right. Uh, you know, I've seen, like, you know, the Tasmanian devil, you know. One of my favorite <laughs> ones is over in, um, in Callis. There's a cemetery there, and there's a man. He's probably about, buried about 20 years ago or so, but he has the engraving of a Budweiser beer can. Oh, on, right. And there's a, <laughs> right above it, there's a little beer cozy, so when you visit him, you can put a can oh, there oh, on his cool. grave. Oh, <laughs> well, I like that. In uh, Hope Cemetery, you know, there's uh, uh, race cars for the young yes. man who's died in his car, and... There's, uh, oh, and it just goes on and on. Uh, pe two people in bed. That's one yes. of my favorite ones yep. so under the sheets. And uh, they're there. And, and there's one. I don't know how they do it. It's a, a piece of, of uh, granite. And it's it's just on the on the corner, on yes. the uh, right oh, so here. balanced? Right? Yeah, it's balanced. Yeah. Oh, I don't know cool. how. I mean, obviously, there's a rod in there somewhere. Probably, But the yeah. darn thing, and there's, there's soccer balls. Yep. And, and I sat next to Mr. Parnagoni one time oh. at an event. Uh, when they had just finished the cello, mm -hmm. and he he told me how he was talking about how hard it was to make the strings, mm. and I, I mean it was just a two-year project of uh, labor of love, as they say. So yeah, it's yeah. crazy. Anyway, yeah. So you've taken pictures. Where where are they? Or um, you can look up online if people search Green Mountain Graveyards. I think there's a, we still have a Facebook page. We maybe haven't updated it in a while, but there's a whole archive of photos right. there. Um, just last month, I spoke to uh, the Vermont Bar Association at their annual meeting. Well, I was going to ask you because so, I'm going to give your name to the Berlin Historical Society. Oh, I, I'll, <laughs> so I'll go talk. Please come to our annual dinner. I'd love to. I'd love to. Oh, that's to. great because these people are really into it. Um, and you know, I got to say, like, I, I, I am always reminded that in my work around Vermont cemeteries, like, I'm standing on you know the shoulders of giants. There are people who have spent you know their whole lifetime researching Vermont cemeteries and visiting you know, them, whether they're a local historian or someone that works at a history center or a library. And, um, you know, often um, I'm kind of more compiling information than necessarily discovering uh, something new because there's, a, you know, Vermont's a history state and, yeah, it and is. we're very lucky here, you know. That's great. It's so cool. Um, and you mentioned earlier you're writing a book. Yeah. Um, and so I'm kind of curious if you have any really interesting stories about Vermont cemeteries and what, you know, something that would surprise people to know. Sure, you know, one that doesn't get talked about a lot is um, the uh, mummified Egyptian prince that's buried over in Middlebury. What? Really? And so I'm, I'm writing notes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I'm still researching this one. Um, I forget the name of the cemetery. It's by Middlebury College and um, it's a small stone and it has the full name of the Egyptian prince, which is very long and I can't pronounce it. Uh, it has the, the symbol of the Ankh on there, you know, uh, which was the symbol of rebirth, life and rebirth for the Egyptians. And the story was that um, someone in Middlebury, I think back in the 1940s or 50s, died and they found actually, a, a, yeah, the mummified body of an Egyptian prince in their attic, which they assumed they bought at an estate sale at some point. 
and then just put in storage. Local historians did a lot of research to find out who this was and actually gave the prince a proper burial. So it's an interesting wow. moment when you walk through this, you know, Middlebury uh, Cemetery and a lot of, you know, Anglo-Saxon names and then you come across this one stone which looks like all the other ones but, you know, very clearly is, uh, I think even the uh, the birth date is, you know, um, uh, BC on there. So, oh, wow. yeah, yeah. Um, so I gotta go check that, that out. That is very cool. Yeah, yeah. That, that's a great one, so. Who would have known? And I, and I think a lot of these, like, um, Egyptian artifacts were sold privately, um, you know, before museums started getting their hands on them. So there's still quite a few Egyptian artifacts, including mummies, I believe, that are st still in private circulation. So it's, it's very interesting, and you wouldn't even, like, con think about that happening, you right. know, until you start diving into that history. You so. don't have That's an actual amazing. total of the number of, of uh, graveyards we have in Vermont. I know Berlin has seven, seven or nine. Mm-hmm, uh, mm -hmm. My best guess right now is that if you include private and public cemeteries and, like, farm family cemeteries. Right, we have one up the street, a family uh, in the uh, gated. Right, right. Yep. They're all over the state. About 2,000, I would oh, say, wow. across the state. And so, they, yeah, that's everything from, you know, Farmer Joe, you know, in the field who right. was there 200 years ago to, you know, Hope Cemetery or yeah. Green Mount Cemetery here in Montpelier, which is also, I think, in some ways rivals Hope um, for uh, its, its, its stonework. That's so, great. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, what is the one um, name that goes uh, up to on Route 302 Elm Elmwood? Oh yes, that and, and is, Barry. That reminds me of the of the largest chess board. Just the way they have yes. they have for some reason they have very tall um, spine co um, columns. Yeah, uh, and it just looks like it's um it, we go up there and it always reminds me of some kind of chess board that they're playing. Right, you can just pick up the, yeah, the and move them it's, around. It's really yeah, cool. It's a beautiful cemetery. It is actually I live right around the corner oh, from that you? cemetery, so I, I like to joke that I can be there in ninety seconds if I need to be. I don't know why I would need to be, but I can. <laughs> What's up, not too soon. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, and that was the uh, original um, town cemetery. So a right. lot of the town founders are buried there. A uh, governor, Dean Davis, is buried there as well. So uh, I walk in there like once. A week. I love that. Oh, that's one. wonderful. So. Yeah, we go up and take pictures all the time. So you have been a marvelous oh, thank guest. Thank you I so can't much. Thank you enough. Yeah. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for tuning in. I know you enjoyed this. I sure did. I will see you next week. And in the meantime, keep listening beyond the sound bites.